all heard this term, health worker heroes, but really, they're health worker humans. Health workers are just people, like us. They've been working in incredibly challenging situations, especially during the past year. They're not magic. They don't have superpowers that let them never sleep or make them invincible against disease. They are real people. They're people who have families and hobbies and needs inside and outside of work. If 2020 taught us anything, it's that health workers are essential to us all. But we never ask the question, what's essential to health workers? Well, this is a question we spent a lot of time thinking about at InterHealth International. And the answers are many. Health workers need decent housing, steady and fair paychecks, regular training, masks, gloves, and other PPE so that they can do the job safely. They need protection from burnout. They need protection for their mental health. And they need supportive supervisors and strong managers and the right technology at their fingertips. There's a lot of complexity in delivering healthcare. A lot of moving parts that have to come together so it can happen. And health workers who are trained, equipped, and deployed where they're needed most are at the center of it all. So that's why we look at the whole health worker and the whole health system. You can't just focus on medicines, for example, to fight disease. Drugs and medicines are essential. We're all thrilled that now we have these amazing COVID vaccines. But there's so much focus on the vaccine that no one's talking about the people it will take to deliver them. We're talking about a massive global vaccine rollout that's bigger and faster than humanity has ever attempted. There are 7.8 billion of us today. Who is going to give all those shots? 
We're going to need more nurses, midwives, community health workers, all ready and deployed to every city and village in the world. So if we don't have the right people in place, no amount of product will help us succeed. We need lab techs, IT professionals, drivers, cleaners, advocates, clinicians. They're all health workers and they're all essential. So we need to invest in them. So one thing you can do today, right now, is to make sure your elected representatives in government know where you stand. Let's call on them to act for health workers. Let's ask them to make an emergency and long-term investment to better support and protect health workers, to ensure there are enough skilled, equipped health workers to deliver life-saving vaccines and essential health services for everyone, everywhere. When we invest in health workers, we invest in our future, the future we want. You know I'm nothing other than human, human. to Switchpoint Essential, uh, where we are going to talk about the healthcare workers. And we're not just talking about the healthcare workers in the ICUs and the nurses by the hospital beds, you know, uh, in the wards. We're not just talking about, you know, the paramedics in the ambulances, but we want to touch on the um, families of these healthcare workers. We want to touch on the community healthcare workers, you know, the ones that are walking long distances to get into people's communities to be able to deliver healthcare. We want to talk about, you know, the whole ecosystem, you know, that makes up global health. And so we're switching over uh, to the uh, switch point stage um, to essential workers um, to celebrate their tenacity, their strength, their creativity, their ingenuity, their ability to just come um, to overcome challenges against all odds. And despite of all of that, uh, despite of even the toughest of times as uh, COVID-19 has shown us, uh, also their joy. And COVID-19 actually has taught us all what the meaning of uh, essential is. And that is what we're going to focus on uh, today, uh, the essential uh, healthcare workers. I am a global health advocate. Absolutely no one, no one should ever die just because they could never access uh, a healthcare worker just in time. And no healthcare worker should die on the front lines trying to save our lives. And yet, for how many of you listening to this uh, can relate uh, to this reality that uh, a lot of us in one way or the other have been faced with or have seen or, you know, have read about, um, if you're lucky. When I first started a lot of my advocacy work uh, for health workforce, one of the striking things that really, really uh, made a lasting impression on me, and I will never forget um, this young student um, was just talking to him, uh, rec was recruiting students uh, to study, um, you know, clinical uh, medicine um, to be able to serve, especially in the rural and underserved um, areas where there's shortages of healthcare workers. And um, was asking this young man, I asked him, what is it that motivates you, you know, to become a healthcare worker? And do you realize that most likely you might end up working in the rural, hard to reach areas? And so he narrated um, a story about um, him and his family uh, leaving home around three o'clock in the morning 
um, walking, you know, passing through the hills, the hilly terrain, and it took them, you can calculate the hours, but I think he said that he left home around two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Um, by the time they arrived at the clinic, at the health center, the nearest health center, it was around seven o'clock in the morning. And there was such a long queue already that by the time that uh, the nurse or the clinician at that facility actually came uh, to see um, their sister, that was around two o'clock in the afternoon and she died right there uh, on the queue. And so this young man was determined uh, to become a healthcare worker because he never wanted anybody to experience that in their lifetime. But also he often wondered, why is it that nobody ever wants to come and work in my rural community because it's so far, because there's no lights, there's no power, there's no electricity, no healthcare worker is motivated. And so I am training to become a healthcare worker um, just so that I could serve uh, my community. And so we often hear of the stories of the women in, in the rural areas again um, who um, because of their um, um, social economic and other challenges are just not able to just uh, take that um, many hours you know to go to the clinic and therefore rely on the community healthcare workers who come to their homes you know visit them and these community healthcare workers are faced with challenges you know they have to walk long distances you know the extreme weather conditions just to access um babies born and, and, you know, young children to immunize them, to just, you know, check on them and give them the essential care that they need. And so we also know, especially within the uh, COVID-19 pandemic context, you know, we've read and heard of so many horror stories, actually, um, of, of, of the, of the clinicians and the medical professionals that really have essentially given up their lives. They've moved out of their houses and just like, you know, um, separating themselves just because they don't want to infect, uh, their loved ones with the pandemic because they are on the front lines. Uh, we've heard uh, recently, I think there was a number, about 17,000, uh, almost 18,000 uh, healthcare workers that have just died uh, from uh, the COVID-19 infection themselves. And so um, we have these figures as well uh, from the WHO that do project a shortfall of about uh, 18 million um, healthcare workers uh, across the world, and most of these will be needed, especially in um, resource limited context, you know, where it's high disease burden and severe shortages uh, of healthcare workers. And it's something that drew closer to home. I mean, I've seen this, I've watched this, I've like, you know, followed and worked alongside uh, um, amazing um, health worker professionals, very committed to their work, to saving lives uh, for a long time. But just about, um, this must be like about four weeks ago now, five weeks ago now, uh, my aunt, who was just very well, you know, fine. And um, uh, one of the mornings she didn't wake up feeling well. Of course, she had been complaining of a specific problem and um, they took her to the hospital. But guess what? The time she arrived at the hospital is nothing compared to that um, young young girl that died, you know, uh, that I spoke about earlier. But she arrived at the hospital, but the time it took um, for her to be seen uh, by a medical professional, it was about two hours later. And she died right there uh, in the car park as the doctor was called to say, well, she can't even move. Like, you know, they had to come to the car. Uh, trying to get her out of the car and as we well, like you know taking her they pronounced her dead right there um because the healthcare workers and we're not just talking about you know the, the doctors and the nurses but just nobody was there to attend uh to her and I often wonder and this is very painful and it's something that I'm like you know um had it been had it been that we had um enough healthcare workers, enough staff to just rush this, this patient in, in a critical condition to just rush and get her in and get her to be seen by a medical professional in time. Would she have died or would she have been alive? I would never know. I would never have answers to that. But I think one thing I know for sure is that maybe, maybe if she was seen earlier by a medical professional, her life could have been saved. Who knows? And so there is so many stories, so many people uh, who have lost their lives. And guess what? I really wish that on that death certificate, cause of death could be 
couldn't see a healthcare worker in time. And for those health worker professionals who have lost their lives due to COVID, the cause of death could be there's just not enough healthcare workers in the world. And so despite what COVID pandemic um, has shown us, about how essential and how critical this professional is. We're talking about life and death. Despite all of this, we not see, we're still not seeing sufficient enough action. I mean, clapping your hands at 7 p.m. for healthcare workers is nothing. I mean, that's what we saw communities like just, um, like just, you know, recognizing that we have a key professional, you know, I call them angels. These are special people, you know, but just going out of their house at 7 p.m. to clap hands for them is not enough. You know, we've seen political leaders addressing and saying, well, we will have to, you know, we will have to, a lot of promises, empty promises, but nothing still despite COVID-19 um, is coming out from global leaders, from governments, from donors, from whoever, you know, to just really put uh, money and investments and effort towards where their mouth is, you know, to really tackle this huge problem of the shortage of healthcare workers globally in the world. And so how many more babies are going to die? How many more mothers, aunties, how many more sisters, how many more brothers, how many more healthcare workers are going to die from cause of death, a lack of a healthcare worker, or I am a healthcare worker? How much more time will it take? My name is Robert Johnson. My, I am eight years old. My mother is Margaret Odera. And she takes care of us. And I love my mother. She's the best. Hi. My name is Wycliffe. I married, married Margaret. I love her. <laughs> health worker is as important as life itself. We can see even during this pandemic right now, during the pandemic that is taking place right now, health workers are the frontline soldiers. They are the main people now on focus. So a health worker is as good as life because I myself, if it was not a health worker taking my hands, mentoring me, treating me, I could have been dead by now. Okay, hello, my name is Margaret Odera. I am a community health worker and a mentor mother in Mother and North Health Center. And I became a health worker in the year 2009 when I had involved myself in an act, a very active support group of a pregnant and lactating mothers who are HIV positive. I gave birth to a HIV negative baby who died of pneumonia, unfortunately, after four, four months after delivery. But I continued with the support group and I was, I was I was, uh, I was picked by the Mothers to Mothers program to go for a six months training as a mentor mother in Thika. So after the training, I was deployed in Mother Renault Health Center as a mentor mother and as a community health worker absorbed by the government of Kenya and by the facility itself. Yeah, so in my 10 years of uh, work, I'm happy to see the results that I'm seeing right now. Okay, what I know about as a health worker, what I know as a health worker, I know how to provide informal counseling and advocating for health needs, for local health needs. And in the, in the process, I, I go to the community, I know how to do defaulter tracing, to trace defaulters, and uh, to do you know, house to house visits, to check on the mothers and the babies who are malnourished. I know how to do first aid, to a, a, a patient who has a diarrhea, uh, taking uh, basic things like uh, blood pressure. Yes, taking things like, uh, you know, blood pressure and, and uh, asking basic questions on, on pregnancy. Yeah, I also know how to give health talks in the facility and doing our one-on-one counseling 
in any aspects, including HIV and any other aspects. I do one-on-one -on -one session of mentorship. So I know how to mentor a mother who is HIV positive from the time she gets pregnant up to the time the baby is 18 months to have a HIV negative baby. That's why I say a health worker is as good as life. That is how important a health worker is. Without a health worker in this world, I don't know with the outbreaks that are taking place, I don't know who could have been alive up to this moment. Thank you. Hello to you all. My name is Edwin Ikwaria. I am the Africa Executive Director of the One Campaign. I am a passionate activist and a very proud African, and I'm thrilled to be taking part in the Sweet Point Essential Exchange Discussions. It is all too clear now that when a nation does not have a healthy population, there is no way that nation can pull itself out of poverty. Almost 20 years ago, African leaders recognized this fact and in turn committed to spending 15% of the national budget on the health sector. Unfortunately, many African countries have not kept that promise, which meant that when the COVID-19 virus surprised all of us, Africa was ill-prepared to combat the pandemic, especially with a very weak health infrastructure. Although the continent has been spared of the high fertility rates and the relatively high number of infections when compared to other continents, Africans can never forget its impact in a hurry the first lockdown responses, the rise in food prices and the commodities and now dealing with the need to secure vaccines have left a large part of the population without access and in dire need of support. We have seen how a health crisis has turned into an economic crisis and millions of households have lost their livelihoods. Africa has experienced an economic shock that has resulted in the worst recession in 25 years and eroded the gains we have made in the fight against poverty in the last 15 years. While we have seen our fragile health system stretched to its limits, the real heroes on the front line, our health workers, have made such amazing sacrifices to save lives while putting their own lives at risk. We have lost more than 100,000 health workers globally. My wife, Amarachi Daniels, who works with the NHS, continues to care for the sick in the UK. Each day she goes out to work, our hearts beat faster than normal until she gets back and we are always in trepidation, anticipating that she may come down with the virus. When she eventually tested positive, and I also tested positive, we could not be grateful, more, we could not be more grateful that we are among the lucky ones. A huge shout out to my wife and many others like her who are on the front lines. At one campaign, we have been relentless in our quest to end extreme poverty through our campaigns. The pandemic has made our work more critical with a new challenge of ensuring that everyone gains access to life-saving commodities like vaccines and an economic recovery that is hinged on global solidarity. We have campaigned tirelessly for the Act A and the COVAX facility, and it comes with great relief that the COVAX program has now started to deliver vaccines to several African countries, starting with Ghana. The program is a crucial first step to win the fight against this invisible enemy, particularly for health workers on the front line. However, more still needs to be done. We recently published a report showing how richer countries have secured an excess of more than 1 billion doses of vaccines that they may never use. We need to always remember that until everyone is vaccinated, none of us are safe. And the most essential thing we need is, the most essential thing is we need each other to be safe. Thank you.
Ini sepuluh kali rumah di wali. Rumah di wali sepuluh bandar. Ini barang yang dah menasak. Ada sandu juga. Nah, saya bingkai nikah kelan yang mahu para kami nampak. Sehala mari sultan bin kuri kufen minosam. Fira kami kakana kisah mau kana, bokeh ijen hong bela kana. Ode kaji lepas. Bos suatu buati muka, orang beli muka sahunya ape. Asli ni orang masa ni ada orang ini ada beberapa suara suara. Alah ode kaji. Alah kaji nak kaji mana? Ode dah lama dah so. Neto isha kajati yone sarka amani ne bara la kujum nena bara inge la fufu taka mo esansi kaje mo ni la mo ni yechuru mbaga ya tu 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 kuge la fufu tani pasasi uche angi mo kumuni tani kuge la fufu tani uche ne yone sela. Jam, 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 Without illness, to see my children having a good condition, a good condition and education. I'm proud to help the small groups in our village in the term of family planning services. I am Evariste Simaringoma. I am the husband of Angelique. She is a mentor. Yes, I, I love her because she likes her work. Uh, where she works as a mentor and a uh, uh, health uh, 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 staff. Um, in uh, her work, she serves people. It is a hard work because uh, she works even the, the weekends. Also, she helps the surrounding families in terms of uh, family planning. So uh, my family, it is proud of being a role model uh, in the family planning. Well, my name is Mohamed Sabukwao, a driver from White City Intrahal. Uh, during COVID time, actually we had gone to Busiwa Health Center for data collection. When we reached there, we got an emergency of two ladies who were anemic. <laughs> And actually, one of them was pregnant and was about to give birth, and she could not, she couldn't do anything. She was at the point of dying. I decided to talk to the colleague I was with at that time to rush to Mbale and pick blood because there was no transport. They had stopped all vehicles that were moving. It's only us and means of health vehicles that were moving at that time. So they allowed me. We drove to Mbale Hospital to get blood. When we reached the blood bank. There was no blood. We had nothing to do. I had to talk to the doctors there that how come if I can donate blood for these people and we take to them. They told me we need to get at least at first the blood group. I told them it's okay. We can get the blood group and when they checked my blood group, it was indeed matching those people that I could give them blood. So they decided, they decided to believe me and we took the blood there. Actually, the blood came from me, and I took it to Busiu Health Center, and we saved the life of those people. My name is David Avila, and I'm a fashion designer from Kimbera. David Ochieng is only 24 years old, but he's changing the narrative in his home the Kibera slum in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. He's giving out African print masks, which are handmade for free to reduce the spread of coronavirus. It's tough because not everyone here in Kibera have all the resources to do like the lockdown thing and isolate themselves from everybody because most people live to live based on hand to mouth 
because they have to work for it and then get money from it. He started his fashion line, Looks Like a Vido, in 2017. These days, David wants to protect his community from the pandemic. He wants to raise awareness about hygiene and reduce the spread of the coronavirus. But in poverty-stricken Kibera, it's tough to choose between spending money on hygiene or food. So how can I be able to buy like maybe six masks for my family to give everybody in my family to have the mask instead of buying food? So they'll be like, food, mask, food, mask, so. In Africa's largest slum, residents live on less than a dollar a day and can't afford to stay home. An extra purchase of protective gear like the masks and the gloves is luxury. If you have the mask every time. And uh, when it comes to Yokunawa na sanitize. David Ochieng has given out over 5,000 masks since Kenya's first coronavirus case. Yeah. We find these times as very abnormal times. And as part of the things we do, we try to capture events and um, activities that go on, which are almost um, landmark in our history. Bismarck Edu Asari oversees the creative desk of GTP. He walked me through the hidden details of these popular COVID-19 textiles. This was, in our mind, the first measure that was taken. It was a stay-home measure. It was everybody being indoors. So we find chains and pallets to the chains. So it was like we were all shut in. Um, and the beginning, in the middle of March up to April, there was nothing you can do but to just stay at home. So that was the concept, stay at home measure. Okay. These mirrors are symbols of hope. It's just a matter of like simplifying how the message is interpreted by the people. Make sure everyone is playing their role. And they can't play their role if they don't know what their role is, you know? Matari is like the second largest slum in Kenya. This is a place where there is very poor sanitization. People in this community live from hand to mouth. The issue of uh, social distancing is quite impossible to achieve because there are a lot of people living in such, such a squeezed area. So it's important to give like the correct information and the, the correct practical measures these people can use to protect themselves. It's basically the five instructions in Swahili. Stay at home, maintain social distance, uh, wash your hands with soap, cover your mouth while coughing, and call 719 when you're feeling sick. Putting like an illustration of an image that's simple enough to understand. I think that's the beauty of graffiti, where the audience just interacts with their work, with the message directly, like there are no in-betweens. So I feel ultimately that's more effective, because we are sure it's reaching the people, because we are where they live, you know? I like it, I like it, I like it. I can feel the, the resilient spirit of the community here is way stronger than any disease can break. That's the beauty of Matari. Yeah, yo, we can't trust you, we'll avoid them, Baba.
听说有一个狂传病毒，速度传得爽快。护士制毒入肺，胃部送你肺炎，结束十四天都没有什么明显诊断。下一步体温高，打喷嚏，嗓子痛，呼吸困难，无力，我应该怎么办？叫个法人门诊办，你得好好处理，别想摸来摸去或者传递给他人。为了武汉，我们都要坚持；为了温州，我们都站在一起；为了中国，我们不用放弃。One world, one blood. 没有你就没我。为了武汉，我们都要坚持。为了宇宙，我们都站在一起。为了中国，我们不用放弃。One world, one people. 没有你就没我。为了人民服务，英雄们都出来，医生们在，护士姐妹在，军医在，海外华人也在。有十天见医院的朋友，你们辛苦了，有你们的付出，才能有我们的未来。为了你们，我们都又有希望。My name is Dr. Percy David Papa Akwete. I'm a health practitioner currently at Winjo Medical University's first affiliated hospital. I'm studying my PhD in hepatobiliary surgery. I'm a multilingual performer and the lead singer for Soul Band. I'm from Ghana. I'm Abraham Ampon. I'm from Ghana too, engineer, but currently at Winjo University. I'm a music producer too, and then an instrumentalist. A beats, yeah. So,、uh, in a normal day, go to the hospital and be either work in the lab or at the research center. After we're done with that, we go back and we do one thing that we like doing the most, and that is music. Yeah, again, again. Yeah, we have a band called Soul Band. Soul Band is is for a group of guys that live in Wenjo, and that is what we do, and we love doing the most. Yeah, yeah. Talking about music,、um, the COVID nineteen rap song. Yeah. Um, it basically came up、um, sometime、uh, last year,、um, around January,、um, when the whole virus thing started, and、uh, the band sat down together and said, "What can we do、um, to help influence and create awareness?" And we said, "Doing music is what we love doing the most. Why don't we do that?" And then we decided to to do the song. I was given the task to write the music, so I wrote the music and I sang it. And a beats, and I produced the music, the beats, and then recorded everything. But you know, just as we are talking about making their decisions, all this were done on the phone because at that moment nobody we couldn't meet, so everything was to be on the phone or in a distance. Yeah. So all this was on a WeChat call, and we did that, and、uh, we were tasked to make the song in a very short period, and also. Um, to make the video and also equally in in that same short period,、um, during that time it, it wasn't easy going around. Yeah, I know, but、uh, that moment you were working at the checkpoint. Yes. So at, at that time I was also working at the checkpoint.、Um, in in China the checkpoints were basically created to prevent people from getting people who do not believe, live in certain community communities to get into、um, other communities, and that was where、um, I used to work. So when we sat down and we decided to make make the music, we were we were point. With the task of what to do, so we created something that、um, that 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 could inspire people, something that that was telling the story of what was happening at that moment, something that could create an awareness on what to do, how to protect yourself, something that was pra- was praising our health workers and then people that contributed immensely to supplying nose masks and so on to 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 deprived areas. Yeah, it's it's basically because I remember. That moment, it was tough. Yeah, it was very difficult. And、um, after the music was made, the video was made, and it came out. It got a, it got a very great Good, reception. Yeah, yeah. yeah.、Uh, from、exactly. from the local radio stations to the provincial TV stations and newspapers and national and. We even got some some interviews from back way back at home in Ghana.、Uh, we were honored by Joy News to to feature us because they had seen our music and the content and how and what it was propagating and and they decided to help in spreading the word and and we're really grateful that what we had planned to put together was really coming into reality. Yeah,、reality. exactly. Working for Dreams Project, I'm working at Mahmiri Clinic. I work with children and young. Ad- I, I work with adolescents and young adults from the age of ten to twenty-four, where we give them services such as treat,、uh, treat, treating them in general, offering them 
health education on family planning, offering them PrEP and also giving them PEP services. We had to give these services even during COVID-19. At the COVID, at the beginning of COVID-19, it was scary because the virus was new. Everyone has to stay home. People started working from home, except for the essential services. It was news to me. The scariest part was the virus is new and it was Asia and Europe being the epicenter. We saw on TV people dying. We saw on TV where hospital were flooded with large numbers of people. So we were so afraid that if the virus hit Africa, we are going to die because we were lacking um, PPEs. And the scariest part was also that the community didn't obey the COVID-19 regulation. They will come to the hospital without mask. They will come without sanitizing their hands, their hands properly, and there the, 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 there was nothing like um, social distancing because they will often come in large numbers. Just I don't know. Maybe they were also scared, and if they just feel like they are not feeling well, they will just come to the clinic, and. We were giving them health information regarding how the virus is being transmitted, but still they keep flocking to the clinic in large numbers. But despite this, we still have to continue giving them services. Uh, at a point, I was becoming insane at a point that I even have to sanitize and wash everything I brought home because I was really afraid I'll, I'll, I'll get infected and then I'll come and pass on the disease, the virus to my friends and my family. I have a two-year son that I had to send to my parents in the north just to protect him. And at the clinic with my colleagues, everything we talked about was just about COVID. Everybody had, everyone didn't have concrete and reliable information. We were getting misinformed and misperception from social medias. So it was very scary, a scary thing to us. And there were a time where some of our colleagues, colleagues get uh, infected with COVID-19 and that they had to stay home for more than two weeks for them to recover. We were so afraid that Anytime you are thinking that you will be next and you will not know if you are going to survive or not because a lot of misinformation was going around. It was very scary, scary thing for us. But later on, the information and the research became available. So we, the fear started to fade. So we have to continue giving services to the nation because we hold that noble responsibility and the duty for the nation. Thank you. After hours, when we knock off at 5.30, I come here, train with my good camp. We do apps, we do running, and we do cardio. This takes our mind off work. We come here and relax. We are at peace. Our mental health is at peace. We don't talk about COVID-19 when we are here. We just relax, and I like it so much. Yo. Okay, this is my team. This is what I do after work. They have temporarily left their posts, dressed in bright orange and their hospital gear, just to come and lift their spirits. And there couldn't be a better way to do it than to join the rest of the world in dance to the tunes of none other than Jerusalem a dance. Hey! <laughs> the song is being celebrated all over the world. We wanted to show Basutu Nation that uh, even at the hospital, it can be a happy place. Nurses, the supporting staff, 
can be very happy people every day, every time. Yeah. For a day trying to keep my hands clean I see them taking advantage I don't know what man's mean We all hope and pray waiting for that vaccine Corona is real, Corona ain't friendly Corona really kills, yes Corona is deadly I have now signed a second proclamation Declaring the state of public emergency Hey guys, remember to always wash your hands, wash the back, wash the front, wash the inside, the fingers, each one, you should wash it, and if you sneeze, you should dab, if you cough, you should dab, if you sneeze again, dab, 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 dab. Dès qu'on a senti qu'en fait les choses allaient de mal en pis, on est tout de suite allé voir le ministère de la Santé pour lui demander comment on pouvait coopérer. Hello, my name is Margaret and Melon. We are in the 51st African Children's Choir and we come from Uganda. And when I grow up, I would like to be a doctor and a nurse. We are praying for all of the frontline workers around the world who, who are helping save lives and keep people safe. Please accept this song as our appreciation for the work you are doing. May the Lord bless you and take care of you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look at you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May the Lord bless you and take care of you. May the Lord. COVID-19 is here, people just begin to fear, fear not the solution, just take the precautions, wear your mask and wash your hands, don't let people shake your hands, life ya, jari ni agone midi kwa macheba, yani ni afajeke, because corona tefike, idambaka jinda ine, soka jeka gali keta, make it not a waste time, we just support each other, and together we go make up, make up, wash your hands, avoid touching, up next, we've got a panel of experts coming together to talk about global health advocacy, security, support for frontline health workers, pandemics and health systems, and what is truly essential for the world we live in today. Hi everyone, uh, what a fantastic switch point essential we've been having at this point. And uh, I think you will really join with me in congratulating that choir. It's like uh, tingles on the back of my neck from the, just the passion from those children. It's, my name's Andrew Brown. Uh, it's my uh, privilege uh, to be the moderator of this particular session. And I would like to also uh, acknowledge that we have a number of panelists with us and I'd like to ask them to uh, turn their uh, videos on as we come together. But we're concentrating on 
what is essential to us? And I was reflecting on a number of the things we've seen so far, and the pandemic has really shown us that our work is essential, our family is essential, our health is essential. But what COVID has taught us is that healthcare workers are essential for us to overcome the pandemic. It's the testing, the treatment, administering the vaccines, as well as caring for the regular health issues we experience. I'm really excited to be moderating this panel where we have Amanda Banda, we have Edwin Equoria and Zephora Iregi coming together to talk to us about what's essential with regard to the contribution that health workers make. So please join me in the chat to, to thank these fantastic people. Let me tell you a couple of uh, things about them first and then we'll move together with the discussion. Amanda, who gave such a fantastic presentation to us before, uh, is a global health advocate in East and Southern Africa in the region at WEMOS. She's got over 13 years of experience influencing national governments in Africa, global health institution donors, holding them accountable for what they've promised to do in health. And we have Edwin. Edwin is ONE's Africa's executive director. He's been leading ONE's advocacy work across the continent. He has over 19 years of experience in the development sector. And Edwin previously managed the transparency and accountability portfolio for ONE. And again, a great advocate holding governments accountable as we heard. And we have such a privilege to have uh, Zephora with us, a nurse, one of the healthcare workers at the front line uh, helping us all. A young nurse recently um, graduated and working in the county referral hospital in Kenya, the first vice chairperson of the Kenya Students and Novices Nurses Association. And what a fantastic privilege to have them together. So we're going to have a conversation together and you have welcome to put uh, questions in the chat uh, as we move along. And there'll be a poll or two that will appear. In fact, I think there's a poll that's going to appear now. I want you all to re reflect on um, what you've seen so far and uh, what's been happening to you. And there should be a poll that appearing to say, what is the, the particular healthcare worker that you've found to be or appear to be essential in your own life uh, in recent weeks and months? Uh, so as that polls, poll comes up, please use your mouse and uh, click on one of those um, uh, choices there. Uh, what kind of health worker has been the most essential to you over the past year? And uh, as people are, uh, are clicking on, on that, we will shortly have uh, on screen the results. So you can see, I'm not sure how many people will vote for the AI robot, but uh, some of us rely on technology in order to, uh, to get our work done and um, our health um, answered. So um, Edwin, you gave a very passionate um, uh, introduction before about uh, the COVAX and about uh, keeping governments uh, uh, accountable uh, as part of that. I'd like you to please tell us a little bit more about how ONE is helping African countries lead the charge in distributing the COVAX vaccines. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And indeed, it's a pleasure to be on this platform today to talk about, you know, what we're doing, but also to just celebrate health workers all over the world. Um, I think the very first thing I would say is that we thought it was important to amplify the need for solidarity. And basically that there is no way uh, nationalism that we've seen around the world should play out in Africa, because if we don't do it together, it is very unlikely that we're going to end a disease, you know, anywhere if we don't do it everywhere. And so the first thing we did was to basically make that what we'll call um, a solidarity called global solidarity. And we pushed and made sure that um, there is a coordinated um, plan for the African continent so that Af at the African Union level, particularly with the African Union CDC, there's a central um, you know, coordination thinking and collaborative thinking around what is essential for Africa, what would be the way Africa, first of all, gets itself out of this uh, pandemic. And especially now, particularly with, with COVAX, the first part of COVAX uh, is about funding. So we, what we did was to mobilize and we continue to campaign to say that every funding required or needed you know, for COVAX to operate effectively should be, should be mobilized. And so across the world in the, in the donor countries, we, were, we kept hounding all the governments to put their money to come behind COVAX to make sure it is successful. And even when we got the different, it, it was very surprising that for throughout this pandemic, there was not a time the G7 came together, except just recently. 
And when they came together recently, then they, they made a commitment about $7 billion that got to COVAX. So those are the kind of things we've, we've been pushing for. Then more importantly also is to raise awareness at the local level so that by the time the vaccines get to the countries, um, you know, it, it, it is not met with hesitancy. It is not met with um, on, an unprepared government. So what we've been uh, campaigning for is that each country has a plan to distribute. And so we're happy with the coordination that is happening at the African Union level, but we know that has to also happen at the country level so that when the vaccines arrive, then there is a plan to distribute, first of all, to the most essential frontline health workers, to so the aged people and those that have comorbidities. So those are the kind of things that we've been doing, basically campaigning and getting governments to make the plan available. And we're quite excited to see that COVAX is reaching uh, many, uh, many countries now beyond, um, you know, beyond the first few. Uh, there are still problems, but again, and this is what we kept campaigning for, particularly, I, I, I talk, we, we talked about the rich countries hoarding. They have over 1.5 billion doses in excess of what they need to vaccinate their entire population. So we are still campaigning for doses to be shared so that at least through COVAX, so that it can get to the countries that need them most who could not have access during that time. Um, those are the, uh, some of the key things that we are doing right now to ensure that the vaccines get everywhere. But I'd like to take the time also to ask Amanda, uh, a co-panelist. Um, Amanda, it's nice to have you here. Um, and I know Amanda is very familiar with the work of one. Um, I just wanted to say it's great to meet you here on the screen. First of all, let me quickly ask you, you know, we wouldn't make it through any pandemic without, you know, or vaccination without um, health workers. So, and if we're able, if we're going to see another pandemic, we don't pray for it. We hope it doesn't come, right? But what kind of health system or ecosystem of health workers would you like to see that is already in place in the day that the pandemic is declared? What 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 is the systemic changes you? What are the systemic um, yeah issues that you think should have been taken care of by the time the next pandemic comes? You know, um, in this case, Amanda, over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Edwin, and, and, and great to hear from you and, 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 and also greetings to my fellow panelists. And I really have enjoyed uh, this session and the presentation so far. And so I think we're focusing um, on the essential, you know, word of, of how essential healthcare workers are. And earlier on, I think I spoke about this uh, shortage of um, 18 million uh, health workers uh, across the world. And I think most of these are in, in, in the low income uh, resource limited context. I think we're also at uh, disease burdens is high. And so ideally, you know, uh, yes, we don't want to see um, another pandemic, uh, but I think that um, what we need need to ensure and, and put in place right now, you know, without having to wait um, is uh, to address that shortfall. You know, it would be, you know, an ideal world where we could see like zero shortages where everyone everywhere um, they leave or where they come from, you know, um, I think that me, that would be um, one critical point. Uh, the second general is well funded and is prioritized, you know, um, beyond and above, you know, um, what we often see uh, the military uh, budgets uh, taking priority uh, for uh, national governments in most contexts. We also see that um, a lot of governments uh, tend to focus and tend to see health in general investments as well. Uh, this is um, not an economic investment, but how wrong uh, they all have been. And I think we've seen it uh, with COVID that um, you now have governments now investing trillions and trillions of rescue packages to rescue the economy because of what? Because of health. And so like for me, it's a, it's a clear argument that health um, is one of the key investments that is essential, you know, for economic development, you know, for, for everything else. And so like, we, we clearly have seen the impact of COVID has had on economies across the world, and it's going to take us a lot of years um, to, uh, to recover, you know, and I do hope that we do recover, but I think that, and I hope that should teach us a lesson. Um, the other third thing that also my colleagues have spoken about, and I think I saw also through the testimonies uh, of the frontline healthcare workers is the fact that, um, 
you every healthcare worker is so passionate about the work that they're doing and all they need is to be well equipped motivated of course well paid and protected you know i think at the onset of uh, the pandemic we saw the issue of ppes and just to work in a very good environment i think that is critical and my last point is global solidarity and i think edwin you alluded to this already the hoarding of vaccines like what a world we live in where you know the haves actually keep more than they need while a lot of the other population across the world do not even have access so we need to move from charity based kind of um giving um and uh global health setup to where solidarity and partnership is key where it's not about who has and who doesn't but that we see that uh, health um, is a human right and that everybody needs to have an access um, to healthcare workers. So I think that is my contribution. Um, and I think to end that, I would also just like to turn to, to Zipporah and just ask you, you know, I, I, I really um, like the energy and the enthusiasm um, that, uh, you know, young uh, healthcare workers bring. And I think that you have a lot of responsibility, I guess, and burden, you know, to turn uh, the system upside down. Um, and so if, if you could give one piece of advice to every young uh, nurse uh, who's beginning their career, and maybe perhaps even those that are going into, um, healthcare worker training, you know, uh, today, um, in the face of all that's happened uh, with COVID-19, what would you tell them? Um, thank you very much, Amanda, for that question. Um, I just want to say first that I'm very honored to be sharing this platform with you and Edwin um, and Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I think um, like Edwin shared in his video earlier, saying that COVID-19 um, stretched an already fragile healthcare system to its limits. Um, and I think a lot of us in our countries have come to experience that. Um, and I think what I'd love to tell the young nurses is that they should never give up hope. I think um, now that COVID-19 came and the healthcare system's flaws and shortcomings were uh, given more light, you know, where healthcare workers were forced to work under very extraneous um, conditions just to let them know that in as much as the system seems to be stacked up against them. And you know, there's this notion, particularly for nurses where it is said that the nurses eat their own and it can be very frustrating, particularly when you're beginning your career. But I think I have noticed with a majority of my uh, colleagues um, at the hospitals where I've worked at, even through my training through school, uh, that a lot of us have gotten to uh, carry on what has been going on for many years, where we just complain about things going wrong, complain and complain, make noise, but not really doing anything about it. So I am calling out all the young nurses to remind them that there's a lot of potential that each of us has um, within us to change the systems. And I think a lot of us, when we think about change, we think about big things, we think about policies at the high top level, but it begins step by step, it begins small. You, know, you see, you put yourselves in the situations at the hospital or at the facilities we're working at and see um, what needs to be done, what problems need to be solved. And instead of complaining, take up the challenge, take up the initiative to do something about it. And like Amanda said, uh, partnerships are very key. So we as young nurses may not have um, all the solutions to the problems, but if we partner with those of us who have gone before us, those who have more experiences, partnering with those of us who are our colleagues, who we have studied together with, I know that we can slowly and slowly change the healthcare system and it is possible. So it's just to call on to all young nurses to remind them that yes, we can change this system and the future can only get better. And because the future of nursing and health is in our hands and it's up to us then to build a future um, and a better one um, in, um, yeah, a better one for all of us and for the future generations that are coming behind us. So it is just like take up the mountain, take up the responsibilities in the small facilities, however small or however big um, changes we may want to make just to rise up now as young nurses, rise up young now as young healthcare workers, find solutions to the small, small problems because a journey of others and steps um, starts with one step.
Thank you very much. Um, and I think that is my one piece of advice that we need to just rise up and start making changes. However small they may be, just making contributions slowly by slowly, encouraging those um, who are around us. And I think when the fire is ignited, it only spreads even further and further and the future is going to get better. Um, and I think now that young nurses are, there are many who are graduating from schools, others who are starting their careers, others who may actually be thinking to look into other areas. Um, Amanda, I would like to ask you, um, what role are you playing in advocating for these young nurses? Because we know as they start off their careers, they may need a strong voice to advocate for them, showing them the way, mentoring them um, towards areas where they can cause um, change. Then how, what role are you playing now um, to advocate for these young nurses who may be listening in to us today? Thank you. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Zipporah, for that. Um, yeah, things that I would like to talk about, maybe just to highlight uh, some of the work uh, that we are doing to advocate uh, for, for these young, young nurses uh, for tomorrow and, and even for today, um, stations across the world, uh, academia, and also um, professional associations uh, of healthcare workers uh, like yourselves, nursing associations, um, doctors uh, associations and others uh, to really uh, put pressure on, on governments um, across the world. And these are like governments um, in, in, in low income countries to really, really um, increase and improve their investments in the health workforce. And this is across the spectrum uh, from um, training, uh, healthcare workers, you know, I, I, I think uh, the scholarships are key uh, to ensure that um, there is a lot of investment um, in, in healthcare workers. And so not just training, and I think what we see across, especially uh, many African countries, is that sometimes uh, the healthcare workers are trained and, and you, you have advocated uh, governments and donors, even like, you know, the Global Fund, PEPFA and others to like, we need more healthcare workers, train them, and then they get trained, and then you find a surplus, not, not a surplus in the sense that they, they, they are not needed in the country. So you find the situation that um, the clinics have no uh, health personnel. Um, and I think our testimonies testify to that. And I think yourself, you see this a lot. Uh, and yet you have so many young people that have graduated uh, from the training institutions and they're not employed. And the government is saying, well, we don't have enough money to pay their salaries and therefore we cannot uh, bring them on board. And so really uh, working with civil society organizations and other actors in different countries and globally to ensure that um, the resources are there and that this is a priority uh, when it comes to the recruitment of healthcare workers. I think that, of course, the living and working conditions and, 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 and the retention and making sure that we don't lose them. I think um, the issue of uh, mobility of healthcare workers is very key. And I think that healthcare workers have a right also to migrate and to move uh, to countries uh, where they feel um, they will do better and they have better opportunities. Uh, but we want to ensure that the recruiting countries are also doing this in an eth ethical way. And, and sometimes it's private organizations are also doing the recruitment in, on behalf of richer countries. And so we have also been following on the WHO code uh, of international um, health worker uh, recruitment and mobility to ensure that really countries, while that is not binding, but that countries are really putting an effort uh, to bring transparency um, in the ways of how they are recruiting healthcare workers, especially from poor countries that they never even paid to, to be trained. And you know how much it costs uh, to train a healthcare worker and just to bring fairness into all that. Uh, so those are some of the things that we, we do. And I think at the onset of the pandemic, for example, last year, uh, we did reach out to the major funders uh, from, from, from the World Bank to Global Fund, the European Development uh, Commission, uh, Gavi, uh, the Global Financing Facility, or IMF, to really ensure that as everybody was really putting pressure um, to, to the COVID response, we need PPEs, we need uh, a lot of things to happen. I think uh, with a lot of civil society organizations, 143 uh, civil society the organizations from over 37 countries, we called on these major actors to really uh, support 
uh, the healthcare workers in terms of we need more numbers, they need to recruit more, um, they need to put that additional resource to ensure that um, people are not overwhelmed. And so we have seen some responses, but again, it's not enough. And so I guess this is a call to all of us, again, to continue that work and that push to ensure that we really truly reach uh, that point where we do not have that 18 million uh, shortfall. And um, so I think that's um, just some of the highlights of the work um, that we are doing. And I would like to go back um, to Edwin and ask also uh, a question to you, Edwin. Um, how is one um, working across sectors um, and coalitions to make progress um, on this incredibly challenging work, you know, from vaccine distribution today uh, to ending poverty tomorrow? Over to you, uh, Edwin. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, my panelists, again, um, for, for this opportunity. I think one of the biggest challenges we've seen, particularly on the African continent, is the resource constraint. Um, Amanda talked about the, the, the number of healthcare workers that are, that are I mean, the, the, the gaps that we, that we have. Right now, let me give you as an example. In March this year, in the first quarter of this year, what we realized was that during the, in the peak of the pandemic, when it was actually beginning, when there was a shutdown, a lockdown everywhere, the Nigerian government spent 99% of every of its federal revenues to do to, to service debt. 99%. Basically, they had only 1% left of the revenues they accrued to, to run the government or to even run the country. That was how bad it was. And it looked, it sounded unbelievable, but that was the reality because you know, even the, the major source of uh, foreign exchange was um, petroleum. It was selling at negative. It was at the, at the peak of it. It was not just selling at, at you know low. It was selling in the negative. So they were even have to pay people to hold their their petroleum. That is how bad. So what I said, the health crisis is turning quickly to an economic crisis. What we are trying to do now is to find the resource. Where will the poor or resource constrained uh, you know countries across the world? How do they get the liquidity to be able to one access or purchase vaccines? COVAX is one step because COVAX is aiming to, uh, to hit 20% of the population, but 20% will not give us herd immunity. And so it needs to hit 60 to 70%. And to reach that, it means a lot of resources, right? Now, it's been over six to $7 billion on the African continent to acquire vaccines to reach herd immunity. But the money is not just there. And this is the real way, this is, the, this is, this is, the, this is what we've been very focused on. First of all, Countries who have made the bet and they now have the, the, the bet is paying off with the vi vaccines that they have, make these vaccines available to the rest of the world. Because if it doesn't get across the world, you cannot even be safe or secure on your own because the virus stays longer, it then it mutates, it becomes more dangerous again, and then it gets transmitted. So that is the first thing we've, we've been calling for, the doses sharing, we've been calling for support for uh, the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX to ensure that they deliver. The other one is, now, how does uh, Africa or how does the rest of the world recover economically? My Africa is currently experiencing 20, uh, recession for the first time in 25 years. The gains in taking people out of poverty that have been gained in the past decade in the last 10 years is eroded completely. In fact, the latest numbers show that about 30 to 40, uh, 50 million people will be sinked further into poverty because of this situation. But how can you get them out of it? when rich countries are spending trillions of dollars to, to uh, you know, stimulate or re-stimulate their economy, the African countries are barely able to put together as a whole less than $49 billion as a whole, as a continent. And these are the, these are the calls we've been making to so that we can transition. The, the, the liquidity needs to be available. And that is why we're asking uh, right now, we're calling for the SDRs to be allocated from the IMF. And we are saying that even when they are allocated, this, the, the, the richer countries will get the bulk, but they should find a mechanism of reallocating them to poorer countries who don't have the financial muscle to re-stimulate the economy. This is, what I've, this is what one has been mobilizing and campaigning for in the past uh, few months, and this is ongoing right now. Today we launched, uh, yesterday we launched Pandemica. Basically, it's a, it's a cartoon series that indicated that if we don't deal with the virus everywhere, nobody will be safe anywhere. And that is the message we kept uh, you know, hammering on. So um, I, I know it's, it's, it's a lot of time we've spent on this, but there's a lot more that needs to happen. But Africa needs economic recovery. We need jobs. 
to be able to recover. We need a lot of fiscal injection to be able to recover for the countries to run themselves. And that's what we've been campaigning for. I'd like to just quickly, you know, push the questions now to uh, Andrew. Uh, and the, and the, 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 my question here will basically evolve around, um, where do you see an interconnection between global health and ending extreme poverty? You know, not just from the point of view of vaccines right now, but the whole intersection, the connection between those two sectors and how are health workers essential, you know, in both of these, both in the global health as well as in ending extreme poverty. Oh, thank you so much, Edwin. And to our other panelists, uh, the, the energy and the uh, ideas uh, and the approaches are really encouraging. And I would encourage everyone who's uh, listening to type some of your reactions in the chat and let, you know, let us know how you're feeling. What are you agreeing with? What do you want to hear more information about? I think that will really help us uh, as panelists as we're interacting with you. So take the time to do that. And Edwin, um, to your question specifically, I mean, you, you started to answer the question for me, and that's that, that, that intersection. And I think a good place to look is at the standard, uh, the, the um, sustainable development goals. So we're, most of us uh, are aware that there are these 15, 17 interrelated goals that are destined to, to change the world if we can make that happen. And amongst those 17, there is the, we're aiming for no poverty, for zero hunger, for good health and well-being, gender equality, uh, and we go on to education and others, and affordable and clean energy, et cetera. What's interesting is, is in our societies, these aspects are all interrelated. And you started telling the story. But if I take the story down to a rural community, I think um, we can also understand a bit better. So you asked me also, how are health workers essential um, to these things and that link to extreme poverty? I think during the course of the presentation so far, I've heard the term hand to mouth at least three times by, by people. And the reality, um, and I've had the opportunity to visit a number of, of, of countries, but the reality for many people of the world is they live on less than a dollar a day. They live hand to mouth. And if you can imagine a family, particularly in a rural community, uh, where perhaps the, the father is the main breadwinner, um, uh, uh, the, the mother is involved not only in her family, but also in community. Um, and they do a lot of things together, but just hand to mouth. What happens when that father gets sick or when that mother gets sick? If the father gets sick, where is that income coming from for that family, for their food, for their rent, for the things they need day to day? When the mother is sick, as the carer, the father perhaps has to stay home. Other relatives need to be involved. And this, this cycle of poverty where the healthcare worker is so important because without health, there is the inability to work and to care and so on for others. And this can be a downward spiral in terms of uh, what happens in communities. Health workers provide the knowledge and the skills required to prevent illness and also to treat disease so that we can engage all of us in life around us. And really the work to provide the income, care for our children, grow food in the garden, um, contribute to society. And there's this society ecosystem. Health doesn't sit by itself. Health is one of the key aspects in a complex web of society, but it's very important. And when we're not healthy or members of our community are not healthy, then we all suffer. You mentioned about that we all need to have um, vaccine for the world to be protected against uh, COVID. We all need to be healthy so we can contribute to our communities and, and help each other, particularly in communities without safety nets, um, unemployment benefits, health care, uh, these are things that are not everywhere in our world. So one of the some, some key facts that I think really help us understand, um, we understand that health workers are essential for health and well-being in our community. Without health workers, we can't have that health. We've heard from Amanda that there's these 18 uh, million health workers by 2030 that are going to be short for a minimum set of, of health services. But also, one in three people on this planet don't have access to life-saving medicines, with the poorest countries in the world most affected. But what we also know, and Zipporah, you were pointing out to this and Amanda, that health workers make a difference. And it's not only in people's lives, but also in the economy. The World Bank did a report with WHO, $1 invested in a health worker returns $9 investment into the economy of the country. And this is a health workers need to be considered as an investment and not a cost. And in many countries, they're considered as a cost. We haven't got the wages I heard to pay. Well, we need to think about that, that sort of investment. 
Now, what's interesting is, is 2021 is the, the year of the health and the care worker. You would have seen that slide up. And there is this, this call for investing as a key theme, call for protecting our health workers, and a call for us doing this together. And we really need to be working together about that. And if we do that, then our communities will have more opportunity to develop and grow, as you've been suggesting yourself, Edwin. So I think there is this macro interaction that's at the country level that you've described, and also down in the villages and in families where health is such a contributor to productivity and, and to a community that is really so, so important. And at this stage, we've, we've together discussed a whole range of things, and it's time for our next poll. So coming up on the screen, we want to hear from everyone. As we move forward together to improve the availability of health workers in our communities, where do you think the emphasis should be? Should it be advocating for governments to employ more health workers? Should we be educating more health workers? Should we be ensuring health workers are well supported in their roles? Or should we be securing the tools and supplies these health workers need to carry out their tasks? And while you're um, answering that poll and we'll have the uh, uh, results shortly, I'm gonna come back to each of the panelists and I'm gonna ask you one question. The question I wanna ask each of you to respond to is with your experience, with what you know about the current health worker shortage, what you understand about governments and the interaction between donors and governments, what do you personally see as the next step forward? What should we as individuals on this call be working together to try and achieve? And uh, very shortly, this, this poll is gonna come up on the screen, but um, I'm gonna ask Amanda to go first to answer this question, if you don't mind, Amanda. What do you see as the, what's, the, what's this next step? Where's like an immediate focus? Thanks, Amanda. So I think the immediate focus is to, to, to work with what we have. Uh, I, I mean, I spoke about the 18 million, but most of those are already somewhere um, not hired or not recruited. So how about we start with recruiting all the ones that have graduated that are unemployed, you know, to, 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 to really start um, lowering that number. And then we go to training and then we go to all the other things. I think that would be my mm -hmm. one point. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Zipporah, um, your energy and enthusiasm as the next generation of uh, health workers in your country really touched me today. And I'd really like to hear from you. What do you see as that emphasis that should be happening next? Thank you very much for that question. Um, like Amanda said, we're recruiting more healthcare workers would do us just better because we are really struggling, particularly in hospitals in my country. Um, but I think also um, mentoring the young people, the young healthcare workers, since that they're the future of um, healthcare, I think that is something we should focus on, just to build their capacity in advocacy, in leadership and management, just training them as young as they are, because then that builds a movement toward building a better world, you know, and a better healthcare in the future. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. It's interesting on the poll results that 54% of people have chosen ensuring health workers are well supported. I know you can see that. And I'd like to curry those on the call. Please type in the chat, if you are a health worker, um, what role you play. If you're a, a pharmacist or a community health worker or a nurse, it'd be lovely to see that in the chat as we go. And so Edwin, let me come back to you then. Um, this, this, this question, where do, where do you see this immediate emphasis should be? For me, again, I think systems. I think systems. I think the health, human resource for health is a component of the health system, right? And without adequate financing of the health system, right, it will fail. The whole health system will collapse. So my, my point will be, so you want to recruit people, but you don't want to pay them peanuts. So there has to be a, a strategic decision right now by countries. We've all seen it. Because of health, a health challenge caused a total economic collapse around the world. So knowing this, knowing what we know now, it will be foolish for any government, any policymaker, not to prioritize investments in health, in the health system, you know, with the, with the core pillars, whether it's human resource for health, whether it's, um, you know, uh, 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 training and, and capacity building for, you know, for the health workers themselves, whether it's um, resources or infrastructure or, or, or access to therapeutics and medicines and all of that. Those systemic, a systemic approach for me would be the way to, to think about this. And then knowing that, Health is a service, 
So services are delivered by people. So um, if, if, if you see from that direction, you then begin to think about which one is more, in, which, what's the most essential component of the health system? Right now is the human resource for health. And I think that's where I would like that systemic thinking to begin to happen. Yeah, no, thank you. And then again, from the panelists, we're getting this um, systemic view and the different components to come together. And, and then we're giving that sort of personal view from the professional themselves. Um, Zipporah, I was reflecting on your answer to, to, to my question. Um, you're young, you're enthusiastic, you have opportunity. But my experience talking to young health professionals is they can also feel caged, bound, and unable to make change um, because they get ignored, because your seniors and others don't feel that you have advice worthy of, of listening to. Um, lots of us understand that not to be the truth, and we want that next generation to speak forward. Can you please uh, give us some advice on, on how we can remodel the system or how we can encourage the younger voice to come through in that context, which often in particular culture environments is very difficult to speak mm -hmm. upwards to your superiors. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think I've also experienced a lot of that, um, even with my little experience in being a young nurse. Um, and I think the reason, um, particularly in my country, why that happens is because maybe the older generation may feel threatened that you're young, you may come and take their jobs. Um, I think there's also, um, like Edwin was highlighting on systems, there's not that particular system um, that has been put in place to foster um, and to build the capacity of young nurses. Um, and even when you look at the hospitals, majority, I think um, that may cut across all over, find that the leaders are very old, people who have been there for more than 30 years, um, who are not willing to change um, systems, who have uh, comfortable with the status quo. Um, but I think what we did with part of my colleagues was just to start small. We uh, approached the Nurses Association of Kenya because they had a clause in their constitution that allowed a student's chapter. Um, and through that, we were able to build a following of students from different institutions. And then we were able to um, look for solutions together, give ideas. What do you think? Um, would, how do you think a better healthcare system looks like? What do you think we can do as young nurses? And I think little mm -hmm. by little, now because we came as a group, we came as the voice of young nurses, a group of Kenyan young nurses, then the platform to be listened to was increased, you know, um, rather mm. than what it would have been if we had gone as individual people. Um, and I think that mm. is what Amanda was saying with partnerships. It's just, I think what would raise the voices of young nurses and young healthcare workers is to come together, float ideas. Mm. Um, and I think I've been going through the Nursing Now um, training and there's a lot of focus on advocacy that is mm -hmm. um, grounded on data, you know, give data, mm -hmm. um, do research and show them what it is that you can bring to the table, how systems can be changed. And when you present that with a backing of data and a backing of community, then your voice is heard even more. And, you know, mm -hmm. I also think I'm being a part of that is walking the talk, not just <laughs> making noise on social media or just mm -hmm. raising voices, complaining, strikes and all that. But, you know, where you walk the talk, you say, I think this is what should be done. We have tried it and these are the results. And, you mm. know, how do we move on then from here? Yes, thank mm. you very much. Zipporah, yeah. thank you so much. There is so many practical suggestions mm -hmm. that you've given us in what you've described. Mm -hmm. And as you said, little by little, practical suggestions. Mm -hmm. I want to ask the audience, uh, our participants, just in the chat, just to, to type in your appreciation for our panellists. Uh, Amanda, Zipporah and Edwin, thank you so much for your messages. We've heard strong messages about systems, about the need to invest. We've heard really strong messages about international coordination, about those with money looking to uh, coordinate to help those because we are a global community. From Amanda, we've heard about some really championing um, advocacy elements, uh, particularly around the need to invest in health workforce, the need to protect, uh, the need to train and the need to move forward. But very clear message to Pora from you that the next generation, there is a lot of hope, energy, and opportunity. And we hope that we're able to give you support where we can in order to, uh, to, to, to be able to assist in, in moving things forward. So uh, thank you so much. To everyone on the call, we're not finished yet. Um, we've got some more testimonials, some more artists. And 
really the answer to that question, what is essential following the panel? It will take around about uh, 10 seconds for us to switch back over to the next part of our program. So please uh, stand by and perhaps use that time to type a reaction to the panel in the chat as we transfer. Again, thank you so much to my panelists and enjoy the rest of uh, SwitchPoint Essential. Thank you. Is everyone a soldier? Being in the front line as a nurse during this pandemic, and especially in a mental institution, there's so much that uh, we have to go through. For me, when I heard that Zumba was coming to Madare Mental Institution, I was so excited, I was so elated. We went for the dance, it was fun, we really enjoyed. After the dance, we felt a bit rejuvenated, re-energized, and you know, we were ready to go back to work. The whole dance brought a different perspective of my profession that in the midst of all this of COVID-19 pandemic which is affecting the whole world, they still hope we still can feel fresh and up and go back to work and give the best to our patients. Today, Master Keiji Anomdrebo will make an appearance at a hospital in his hometown to perform Jerusalem with healthcare workers. The atmosphere, as you can see, everyone is happy. You know, we just want to lift them spirits up. It's time for Africa right now, you know, it's time for us also to make the world dance. You know, it's, it's been a long time coming. David Bryden, director of the Frontline Health Worker Coalition, an alliance of 38 organizations based in the United States. We're dedicated to getting much greater U.S. and global investment in frontline health workers, especially in the low and middle income countries. I'm Carol Bales, communications lead for the coalition. We've been saying for years that there's no health care and no global health security without health workers. Now with the spotlight shined brightly on health workers throughout the pandemic, we have to move beyond awareness raising and call for our policymakers to act for health workers. Did you know that 17,000 health workers have died from COVID-19? It's true. In fact, 
Health workers have gone on strike in 84 countries, in many cases due to poor and unsafe working conditions. That's why we're saying that world leaders, including President Biden, when they gather at the G7 and G20 summits this year, must commit to action for frontline health workers. We are also calling on leaders in the US Congress to take on this crisis. Throughout the year, we've applauded health workers and thanked them for their heroic acts. But as we've heard today from our speakers and health workers around the world, health workers do not have superpowers. They are human beings with talents, aspirations, family, and friends. Let's talk about specifics. Countries must prioritize health workers to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. They need to plan for the health workers needed to administer the vaccine to all people. Countries must make personal protective equipment available, as well as needed testing and treatments for every health worker, including community health workers. Countries must provide remuneration as well as additional support and compensation for frontline health workers, including the community health workers. Countries must address the barriers that women health workers are facing in the workplace and open up opportunities for leadership and professional advancement. One way that you can act now is to join us for World Health Worker Week. It's April 5th through 9th and tell policymakers to listen to health workers like we've done today. If you're a health worker, join our video campaign. It's at www.frontlinehealthworkers.org. Tell us exactly what you need and why applause is not enough. Others can help share the videos we collect from health workers and share our policy recommendations. Also raise your concerns with your policymakers and tell them to increase their budgets for the health workforce. Right now, the Frontline Health Worker Coalition is asking the United States government to provide $100 million in new funding for health workers and health system strengthening. Thank you so much for being here today and listening. Links are in the chat. Please check them out and let your policymakers know what you think. We leave you now with a powerful message from a health worker in Poland. Do you think we are heroes? Me and my friends from a variety of medical professions working right now, long hours, short staffed, without proper personal protection equipment, um, unable really to see members of our families, only to keep you all safe. It looks good on TV. It looks good on social media. It looks good when all of you support us through different campaigns and performances. But be honest. Did you think of healthcare professionals as heroes six months ago? Probably not. And to tell you the truth, we don't need to be heroes. Quality universe of healthcare should never be a luxury. It's a human right. Please do think about it after the pandemic is over. Okay, what I think is essential for health workers is information. We need information that is always available and accessible so that we can be able to give proper health education to our clients and for essential for me as a health worker i need peace of mind i need a good mental health in order to keep healthy because healthy is wealthy and if i'm under stress i will not be productive thank you La prevention de l'infection est vraiment importante en ces temps de COVID pour les prestataires de santé, mais aussi pour les clients. Il faut un environnement adéquat, des matériels adéquats, des sources de motivation, des directives claires pour mon travail. Ce qui est essentiel pour moi en tant que sage-femme, c'est l'offre des services de qualité intégrés aux mères et aux enfants tout en leur assurant la prévention et le contrôle des infections. What's essential to me? As a mother of three daughters, access to reproductive health care 
is essential. That every woman in the entire world has equal access to the care they need, that's essential. I am the next generation healthcare worker and I'd love to see a future where every healthcare worker practices at the top of their profession and in unity with one another towards achieving good health and well-being for all. I would love to see a future where the government and other leaders work hand in hand with every healthcare worker to achieve good quality healthcare for all, as well as improve the working conditions for human resources for health, as this go a long way in improving healthcare. I would love to see a future where nurses and other healthcare providers are trained in such a way that they are creative and adaptive to the health demands and needs both now and in the future. I would love to see a future where we achieve good health and well-being for all. Thank you. To me, I think um, forgiveness is essential. Um, I think um, as people, we should learn to forgive each other. We should learn to create a certain soft spot in our heart that can help us to always forgive when people wrong us. I think forgiveness is the beginning of love and it would help, um, help, help prevent all these marginalization that we create and separation that comes between us. Uh, we are all one people, We all because we all have one blood that runs through us. Energies, frequencies, vibes, gods, bacteria, viruses, soul, light, void, spaces, spirit, mind, matter, black holes, microcosmos within concealment of microcosmos, living and non living entities, always essential to the system. Feed yourself, feed the machine. Every action, every inaction, every word, every sound, every silence, or the illusion of it, all matter is essential. It's time to rise up, lift your eyes up, yeah, hope is on the way, uh, and we gon' be the change, cause we are unrestrained, yeah. I'm not alone, I'm never alone. I am a young nurse and I love nursing because it gives me the platform to provide care for those who need it. My name is Zipora Iregi. I am currently a nurse intern at one of the government facilities in my country and I'm also the first vice chairperson for the Kenya students and novice nurses. As a young nurse, I have come to see the working conditions in which healthcare workers have been forced to work under. And in my country, we had a 79 day strike for healthcare workers where we were lobbying for better and on time payments of salaries, provision of personal protective equipment, more staff in the facilities, more health risk coverage, among its other needs. As three of my colleagues, a lot of them have expressed that they are looking to leave the profession and look into other areas. And this does not look well for the future of nursing and of health in general, because we already have a shortage of healthcare workers. For nurses, the International Council of Nurses has already projected a shortage of up to 13 million nurses. I am the next generation healthcare worker. I would love to see a future where every healthcare worker has all the resources they need to practice at the top of their profession. And that every healthcare worker works in unity with one another towards achieving good health and well being for all. I would love to see a future where the government and other leaders work hand in hand with every healthcare worker towards the improvement of health, not just in their countries, but in the world at large, but also work hand in hand with the healthcare worker to improve their working conditions, as this will go a long way in improving the quality of care 
delivered. I would love to see a future where the institution's capacity to train nurses and other healthcare workers is increased, such that every graduate healthcare worker will be able to be creative and adaptive towards achieving and meeting the demands of health, both now and in the future. I would love to see a future where resources are readily made available for the provision of care. And I would love to see a future where we achieve good health and well-being for all. Thank you. Everybody's safe. So I mean, I don't need a question. I tend to tell you, she's not to pump a name. To me, she's not COVID 19. To me, I'm killing a baboon. I could watch a little again. I'm not going to be a little bit. I'm not going to be a little bit. So I'm 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 going to be a little bit. I'm not divided, so nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Me, I want to be safe. Pas tous ceux qui font le taf Dans les hôpitaux, la tristesse sous les masques Mister Akuro nous a piqué dans la face On a tous peur, quoi qu'on dise, quoi qu'on fasse On va gagner, gagner, gagner À nous la victoire, notre histoire Elle va changer, tous les jours, les soirs C'est la messe, frérot, tu sais Akuro nous a tous mis dans la S ah. Mothers of kings and fathers of queens You reign in your quest for the truth Don't strive in your sleep The people in your past can relate Your victory great I saw you on the shits in your grapes Your fathers relate Many cries now, but they never beat the sunrise Swinging in your Fight and we waiting for your comrade. Your faith gon' heal you. Heaven gon' keep you. I'm praying that the sun never leaves you. I feel you here. Hey, se não nos unirmos agora, tudo que construímos outrora destruímos agora. É melhor nos unirmos agora. O futuro das crianças decidimos agora. Covid não escolhe cor. Somos todos alvos. Enquanto não tivemos todos, ninguém tá salvo. A mensagem é básica. Para não mudarmos o nome da mamã África para mamã lágrima. Lume alfa. Scalp can yalefa. I broke a tagalu and did like a go move the tag each other. One day, my people, one day we will be celebrating us. This bed is over. Nothing will be separating us. Cause nobody is safe. Until everybody is safe, oh, everybody is safe, oh. One day, my people, one day, my people, one day, we'll be celebrating, oh, 
Until everybody is safe. Everybody is safe. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. 